Welcome to the Reader House Author Roundtable, where authors from all walks of life come together to discuss the trials, tribulations, and triumphs of publishing their books. I'm Alice Stockton Rossini. Join us here every Saturday night at 8 o'clock or listen to our podcast anytime on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, TuneIn, and Podserve, just to name a few. The Author Roundtable is sponsored by Reader House Online Bookstore, where independent new authors come first. Dave Yeager didn't have a clue when he got his bachelor's in social science that he would wind up in telehealth as a gambling and mental health recovery coach. But his life experience played a huge role, as you can gather from the title of his book, Fall In, a veteran with a gambling addiction. So, Dave, is gambling any different from other addictions or do all addictions basically come from the same place? Physiologically, they basically do. If you look at the scan of a brain of somebody who is, you know, addicted to drugs and is taking their drug of choice right alongside of an addicted gambler who's gambling, the scans of the brain look almost exactly the same. It affects dopamine and it affects serotonin. So it affects basically the feel good triggers in our, in our brain. So functionally they're the same, but there are differences. Like with gambling addiction, there is a very dysfunctional and unique relationship with money. People who become addicted to gambling don't have the same connection and value system with money that most people have because it's the catalyst for the addiction. While it's not the addiction, it's the catalyst for it. So it becomes this strange relationship. <laughs> How did it happen for you? You were, you were in the military and is that where you started gambling? Yeah, actually, while I was stationed in Korea in 2001, it was right after 9-11 I was married. I had two young kids at the time and got stationed, pulled away from them for a year in Korea. Of course, 9-11 happened in September of that year. I was on a plane in, in November of that year going to Korea. Oh, boy. Um, I got over to Korea, got off the plane, took the two-hour trip to the headquarters, in, which was in Seoul, in Yongsan Base in Seoul. They settled me into a really, really nice hotel. The next day I was going to get processed. So I could then get sent off to my duty assignment, which was at the southern end of the peninsula in Pusan. Well, I'm walking around this hotel after I got in. I got checked into my room. I had some dinner. I was tired but not ready to sleep. I was stressed. And as I'm walking around, I found a casino-style slot machine room right there on the hotel, right there on the military base, which I didn't even know they existed because in the United in here in the States, you don't see them. They don't exist here in the States. They're just overseas. Right. So I uh, walked in the room, took a couple hundred bucks out of the ATM. I thought, okay, I'll kill some time till I can sleep. Sat down in front of the machine, started playing. And not long after I was playing, I made what I often call the biggest mistake a budding compulsive gambler can make. And I won. Um, I didn't break the bank. I didn't get kicked out. I just, I want enough that in that moment, I can remember all that stress and all of that fear and all that stuff kind of just washing away in that moment. You know, and I won't say that flipped the switch and made me an addicted gambler, but I can certainly say that I wanted to create that feeling again because it just felt good. Wow. So over the course of that year, that developed into a pretty darn serious gambling addiction to the point where it got me in trouble because I stole from my own unit. I was borrowing from my own soldiers the whole time I'm creating this training system that was being used throughout my unit, you know, and doing all these great things and developing soldiers. But right alongside that was this guy who just couldn't stay away from these slot rooms anymore. Oh, so this is the account in your book. Yeah. Yeah. It goes into pretty good detail. How low did you have to go before you, you decided you needed help? I got divorced from my first wife lost contact with my children for two years. I had oh. gone through several jobs. I was living in my mother's basement, uh, four suicide attempts. It took, and this is the story I often tell, which was kind of the, if you will, the, the low point of my gambling. It was a Friday night. Um, I took a couple hundred bucks. I went to my casino. That was my casino of choice up in Pennsylvania after I had ultimately been kicked out of the army. Went there on a Friday night. Was playing, of course, went way up and then down and then up and then down. And by that point, I never left the casino with any money because I knew I'd play it all out. Mm. So I, of course, played till I had no money left. 
And I thought, okay, well, I plan overnight. It's Saturday morning. I'll go, I'll go home, whatever. I got in the car. I turned the car on. I'm hearing Sunday morning music. Here I had been there 36 hours and didn't even know it. Oh. So I was so depressed and dejected at that point. I drove home. I parked in my local grocery store parking lot because I didn't know where else to go. I took a full bottle of antidepressants, which landed me in a hospital, was there overnight, woke up the next morning, realized I had a paycheck in my mailbox. So I got myself out of the hospital against medical advice, drove back, took that paycheck, cashed that paycheck. Meanwhile, my, my brain is just still swirling from all the medication I had taken. Ah. Drove the hour and a half back to the casino and within four hours spent that entire paycheck. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. At that point, I knew I needed help. <laughs> oh, Dave. I mean, yeah. you know, as soon as I saw the title of your book and I was reading, you know, what it's about, I thought, what? How, I don't know about you, but this whole DraftKings, you know, you can gamble anywhere from your car scares me to death. Yeah. Betting on games. I mean, I know it's always gone on. I, I you know, I've you know, football pools and basketball mm -hmm. pools and guys getting together on Saturday and a good friend of ours, you know, all of his friends would come over. He had a bookie. I mean, you know, it's happening, right. but it, it is so out there, so available. And New York City right now, considering casinos, casinos are going right. to bring in money for education, for this, for that. You know, Atlantic City, I was there when that whole thing happened. And, mm -hmm. you know, building a casino does not solve the problems of a city like Atlantic city they're still you know poor and the schools right. aren't great and i i just don't know how we as a society continue to fall into that trap let me just say this i'm not not a person who is anti-gambling if it's done depending on how it's done and and here's why i say that because 90 plus percent of us out there can gamble relatively safely just like 90 percent of us are better can drink responsibly does that make sense yeah okay but yes. but the, there's there's two things number one you're right the gambling industry is driven by money and it makes its money off people like me it makes its money off people who want to come back who are driven to come back so mm -hmm. even though you'll see DraftKings in a lot of these places will offer out responsible gambling programs which is great and some of them genuinely do want to to engage in that there's still too much money to be made to step too deep into it, you know? So it's all about the money draw right now. And here's the thing. I think we're going to, I hate saying this, but all the things you're talking about and sports betting, yes, it's been around forever, but now it's so different because it used to be, you just found the money line, you bet on Sunday's game, the point spread, right? right. Now the batter's walking up to the plate and you can bet whether he's going to grab his crotch or not. Pardon right. the expression. You can bet you can bet on whether he's going to scratch his kneecap or whether he's going to hit a, a single or a home run. You know, you can bet on just about anything. Yeah. Um, you can just within a football game. How many parlays now can you make within a football game while you're sitting and watching that game with your phone in your hand? Yeah. So, you know, that that less than 10 percent of people who get seriously affected by this is a growing number and you're seeing it. Because it's so available now. It's just yeah. way too available. Right. So, Yeah, it's a little scary. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, luckily now you are in a position to help people. Do you feel most of the people who come to you, does everybody have to get to that low, low point? Is there any way to stop the slide once you're on it? it it's up to, honestly... I think there's a couple of things, a couple of points you made right there. And I focus very heavily on the military because I don't think the military has done nearly enough to address gambling as an issue. And it's a growing issue within the military as well. But anywhere, whether it's military, whatever, number one, it starts with educating people, right? Teach people that, number one, this is an addiction because there are a number of people out there that don't even really think it's an addiction. Right. Teach them what it looks like. Teach them what the signs and symptoms are. You know, teach your people on the floor of a casino or, you know, put an algorithm on an online app that shows when certain things are starting to happen. And you think, OK, this could be a problem. Right. right. So <clears throat> we don't do nearly enough of that. If we did more of that, then there might be more people who begin to step out of the woodwork earlier and say, "Ooh." I just I saw all these signs and symptoms, and I think I might be experiencing that. It could be that I need help. But th at the end of the day, to answer your question, it's up to the individual when they go get help. 
And I've seen people at many different levels, but mostly when they come to you is at the point when they've started losing relationships, they've lost a job, they've spent every, they're so deep in debt, they don't know how they're going to get out of debt. Usually, honestly, it requires, it, it takes going down the rabbit hole for people to realize they need help. Amazing that it's led you to where you are today now. So uh, with this book, is this something that you offer your patients or is this separate from your practice? Yeah, this is this is separate from the work I do for Kindbridge. You know, this I promote through social media. Um, you know, I promote through the things that I'm doing outside of it. And I don't talk about it within it. Um, there are people I've given copies of this book to because I thought it would do them some good. But I don't give it out to everybody. So I'm a, I'm a member of Gambler Conference. Okay. And, and I don't mind saying that out loud because I'm not mentioning anybody else. Um, I live my recovery out loud. I'm not afraid of it. But when you go into these anonymous groups, even if it was a book that was written by a friend of mine, I can't bring that book into one of the rooms because we're not allowed to solicit. And that goes way back. Can I talk about my book after a meeting? Yeah. After the meeting, I can say all I want about it because we're not in the meeting anymore. So what are you doing to promote your book? You're basically relying on social media? Primarily social media. And then through... The publishing group, I I also got a promotional package, which included things like a press release. I started my own website, which I use, promotes not only my book, but my podcast. So yeah, that's, that's mostly what I'm doing is social media, the promotional package, and then my website. Thank you so much. Really good stuff. I appreciate it. All right. Thank you. I appreciate you. Renee Green Murphy has more degrees than most people, but she only mentions one as the author of her first published book, Your Heart's Voice. But Renee, I think we need to talk about all of them to understand how you got to this point. So MSED, right? Masters of Education. Yes, I have three masters though, but that's the one that I used on the book. I didn't want to complicate the cover, even though my mom was like, you should have done that. You should have added all of your titles. Why so much education and just various things you wanted to do or I'm curious. Yeah, I think part of it was maybe indecision at first. I I got a bachelor's in communications, which is very broad and learned all about journalism and writing. And I've always loved to write and wasn't sure what I wanted to do. And from there, I uh, got my master's in counseling. Oh, and I got it from St. John's University and they had a dual master's program which they pitched me on and uh, they said, if you want to be a counselor, but you don't know which niche, which demographic, which population you should get, you should work in our program. And we have a rehabilitation counseling uh, masters as well as school counseling. So I said, okay, I didn't know which population I wanted to work with. So I ended up doing their dual masters. So I have a master's in rehabilitation counseling and school counseling. And then uh, I worked in the school counseling population after that for 10 years in East Harlem, New York City, as a school counselor. Um, I was also in charge of the special ed program. And then I got another master's at Turo while I was a counselor. And I that's what you see. That's the MS Ed. I got my school leadership, which would allow me to be a principal or superintendent to work in in the leadership role in education. And so that there's the three masters. That's amazing. How was how was East Harlem? How was it there? <clears throat> Rough. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but I always other than this job as 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 a as a children's book writer, there there I've always worked in tough difficult areas and demographics. I worked in Jamaica, Queens, in a rehab setting in an inpatient where people would come there if they uh, broke the law. Instead of going to jail, they would come to the inpatient. People that were on drugs, you know, mental illness. It was a women's facility. Wow. I was definitely the minority. And my, it was, I was also the intake. It was my job to get to know them and figure out their strengths. Right. And try to help boost their esteem so that they had some type of a goal. Um, But it was rough. I mean, I was interviewing people that had serious problems, serious. You know, they're telling you like they murdered someone or they were in jail for 20 years or everything. I was like a young girl. It was like it it, it became a little too heavy for me. I bet. It was dangerous. It, It became heavy. And I remember at one point saying to my parents, I don't think I can do this anymore. 
And I stopped. And that's when I started applying for school counselor. So at that point, I got a taste of the rehab. And then I wanted a taste of the school counselor part of the degree. I like the idea of working with children because I had worked with young adults in the rehab, 18 and up, because that's the foundation. I already kind of saw where you wind up in life if you don't have a direction, yeah. you don't have goals, if you don't have family, if you don't have instincts and intuition and conscience and all of these things and values and morals and love. I saw like the product of that firsthand. Right. You know, all these people had a, a similar story. They came from abuse and molestation and drugs and broken families and no moms or no dads and just horrible. So I wanted to do a 180. I wanted to work with children and I wanted to in, try to influence them in, in a positive way so they didn't wind up like those adults that I that I had just been working with. Right, right. So what brought on your heart's voice? So fast forward, I uh, got married and two months after that I got pregnant and I commuted to New York City pregnant until eight months four-hour commute, taking the train, the subway to get to East Harlem, that same counseling job. Oh, my God. And I fell one time in the subway in, during rush hour traffic. And at that point, I was like, this is it. I can't do this anymore. Yeah. You know, after I gave birth, I wanted to stay home. So I did 10 years ago. And then I had another child and another child. But um, my second child in 2017, I remember looking at my husband and saying, I need to do something more. I've always wanted to write. I've always wanted to write a children's book. I feel like I've read like so many children's books by now because at that point I had a toddler and a baby. That's like when the concept started because I'm so big into intuition. There's no children's books on intuition. You know, I this is something that I've always relied on my whole life. And it's a hard concept for kids to understand. I just can't believe there's no books out there. And I thought of the idea then. The the character, main character's name was Divine back then. I started writing it and then I put it down. So that was like 2017, 2018. Life took over. And then it the idea of, of picking it back up again came to me six months after my little brother tragically died in an accident, which was last oh. year um, in the town I live in. So I'm sorry. Thank you. Um, that has been a, a world when, you know, everyone's life just upside down. Um, yeah. It was out of nowhere. And the baby of the family, he was only 33 years old. There was four of us. He was the youngest. It's just, I, I can't even put into words, you know, what that feels yeah. like and what we've gone through. But I found that writing was therapeutic for me on some level. The beach and writing, those are two things that I used as an outlet to cope because I was, you know, in it. The fact that he died in this town that I live in, I couldn't get away from it. Um, on one hand, it was it was it was nice to to run into people that loved him and would stop me and cry, and but I couldn't get away from it either. And right. and writing helped me do that. So I picked up the book again. My intuition told me to, and I decided to dedicate it to him. And I added him as a main character. So in the story, Jade, I changed divine to jade and she ends up drawing an angel for her uncle and that's my brother in the book it's very personalized my mom is in it my dad it's a picture of my children in the back i decided to change jade to jade because it means the jewel of heavens so again there's there's a lot of spirituality written throughout the book um but but more so a personal um memory for my for my brother um and a dedication to him so what's the book about it's about an 11 year old girl jade who learns three lessons throughout the story she learns that by listening to the whisper in her heart which is her heart's voice which in turn ends up being her intuition that she makes good choices and she learns what that is by the end of the book. And it's her uncle telling her. She's questioning it throughout the book. She hears this voice. She doesn't know what it is. She knows when she listens to it, she makes the right choice. When she doesn't, she doesn't make the right choice. And the story ends with um, her uncle enlightening her that, that that's actually called your intuition. And it's something we all have. And it's here to guide us. 
Give me an example of when the intuition strikes her. She hears her mom, you know, clean up your toys. I've always told you to do that. I used very simple examples that any child can relate to because I wanted to be able to target all children of any age and adults, really. If she didn't clean up her toys. Her mom says, clean that up. I've always told you when you're done playing in a room, clean it up. That's how it starts. And she hears the voice in her heart saying to do that, but she ignores it. Then she listens to it when she is called downstairs to eat dinner and the voice tells her to eat her vegetables as she's telling her parents about her day at school. And then she notices that she ended up eating all of her dinner and her parents are so happy and now she's happy. When she notices that her parents are happy, it also makes her happy. Hmm. So I wanted to connect that when we do make good choices and we, we make our parents happy, in turn, it also fulfills us. And then uh, her heart's voice tells her to draw an angel for her uncle. That's how I tie in my brother. Again, it, it would something that would make him happy, but it's something that also in, in the end makes her happy. And she ends up giving it to him at the end of the book. In the middle of the book, though, she's questioning, what is that voice? I don't know what that is. You know, she's only 11. It's hard to explain it. And so she says in the middle of the book, I need to find out. And by the end, she finds out and she ends up making the connection. The, the funny thing about intuition, though, is you wonder whether the voice is real. Is it my yeah. the brain is a powerful thing? Is my am I making stuff up? Or is this really my intuition? Is this really my inner voice? Yeah, part of it is that is is teaching children to learn to trust. When we do listen to our intuition, it is there to guide us to make the right choice, not the wrong choice. Right. So when we do connect that, yes, I remember my gut, my conscience, my heart's voice telling me to do that. And when I did it, it was the right choice. Yes, that was good. I feel better. You know, I feel happy. I feel pleased. You know, I'm on the right path. Right. Then you start to build strength and confidence in yourself. And I also wanted to be able to connect that for people to remind them, especially children, again, why I got into this field in the first place, is that when we think independently and when we rely on ourselves and we honor ourselves and we trust ourselves in making the right choice, it builds self-esteem. And there's so many children and people out there nowadays that seek and search for outside pleasure and outside voices, you know, to fulfill our needs when really it's within. You're never going to feel whole and, and fulfilled by seeking that from others. You need to, you know, love and, and feel that within yourself. And so I, it's also to, to, to help people boost their own self-esteem, especially children nowadays. They have so many distractions and there's just so much negativity out there right. of following the crowd and you know, whether it's social media or what they hear from, you know, musicians out there or, you know, the politics in the world, just the culture is so divisive and so negative, especially for children that they can't even wrap their brain around half the things that they hear and say. Right. I want them to be able to remind themselves to search within, trust yourself. We are all given this gift. It's, it's, it's God given. It's for us to use. And when you, when you listen to it and you trust yourself, you build your own self-worth and your own self-esteem. And then you don't look for others so much. You don't look, you don't seek out, you know, that need um, to please others so much. And that to me is huge. It sure is. Now you're, you're tied in with the educational system in, in New York City. Um, does that help in terms of promoting your book? I'm in contact with the new principal of my school, I haven't sent her my book yet, but she wants it. And my old school, they are a network of schools now, it's multiple elementary schools. So yes, yeah, she's interested in it and she's going to uh, help spread the word. She's willing to help. And then uh, I have a friend who works at another charter school in Brooklyn um, and they want my book as well. So those are two schools. So I'm hoping that they spearhead the uh, movement for me in the city. That is the way to go, building your base. 
Because from yeah. there, from there, you're going to find there's going to be more. Any word of mouth to me is helpful. So yeah. And I've always believed in never burning bridges. And so luckily, I've always kept in good contact with all of my relationships, professional, personal. And so even my college professors are interested. They remember me from 20 years ago. So Turo wants my book and St. John's. And from here, you're going to find the podcast that you will be an appropriate guest for. Yeah, that's what I'm looking for. That's going to work out for you. And then what happens after this book? I've gotten that question a few times and it's like giving birth. And I kind of feel like I have a one month old. So it's like I'm like in like those very early stages of like no sleep, fatigue, you know, brain fog. So I, I don't know. I'm kind of like zeroing in on just like the, the end phase of my book, which is marketing. And once I feel like it's off, it's taken off and I've, you know, I've done everything I could, then I know myself, then I, I, I compartmentalize everything, then I'll be able to like take the time. But I know that whatever I do, I will stick with children's books. I love the idea of the foundation of learning and instilling in them these, you know, important lessons. That is definitely where my heart is. So I will continue with that. And I do feel like there will be a second and possibly a third. Everything in my life ends up happening in threes. Really a pleasure to meet you, Renee. Oh, thank you. All Same right. here. Randall Smith kept journals when he was a kid. He wrote poems and songs and then life happened. He went down a dark road, but eventually it brought him back to writing. And now he's published his first book entitled Never Walk Alone. What happened, Randall? I was incarcerated at the time. I was doing my last year. What I got convicted for, fleeing and eluding. My, my brother had called me. My brother had gotten a jam. So he needed me to come get him. So I drove to the little motel where we were staying at. And uh, when I went to go get him, well, the police presence was there. And they were like, oh. oh, no. Yeah, they were checking people coming out the motel. So when they when they when they ran my brother's name, they seen that he had warrants or whatever. And we took off. So it was like aiding and aiding and abating and a, uh, and a, someone who was escaping from the police. Oh, I helped geez. him to help him. Yeah, I was helping him get away. How many years did you do? I was sentenced to uh, 15 years. I did 12 years and nine months. So how long have you been out? I got out 2021, January 7th. And your last year there, you decided to write this book. Yeah, 2020 is very realistic. I went through the same process, the main character named Tone. I mean, you know, your introduction into the system and stuff like that is very procedural you know it's, it's exactly what you're going to experience if you ever come into that situation so tell me what your book's about it's about this guy named tone yes he's in college tony johnson yeah, he's in college in spring break he goes back to florida to visit his folks and he ends up giving this guy a ride to the store his his friend that he played basketball way back back when they was in high school asked him to take him to the store when he went to the store the guy robs the store and Tone, not knowing Tone was in the car waiting, and the guy jumps back in the car, you know, and and that's how Tone gets implicated in the robbery, and you know, it just everything goes downhill from there. He was he was on his way to a pretty good life. He was the first in his family to get a scholarship to college. Yes. What did he get the scholarship for? Oh, he played ball. He was playing basketball. So he ends up in jail for how long? He was sentenced to. 15 years. So you ask, will Tone, with the help of an inmate named Conscience, get his conviction overturned? Yes. Or will he get caught up with some heavy hitters who lead him down a dark path? Correct. What happens to this guy? So he didn't know what was going on. He was convicted and uh, was sent to prison in Florida. Okay. He pretty much he pretty much hung it up. Like he was pretty much you know he felt defeated like. In a lot of people's situations like that, they, you know, they hear the judge put them numbers on you and you pretty much, you know, there's no way to get out of it. But he ended up uh, speaking with a brother named Conscious who was familiar with the system and he was pretty much, you know, giving him hope that he didn't have to just lay down and do the time that he, he had a chance of getting out if he was determined enough legally, if he didn't do it, that he could, that he could be able to, there's a chance that he could prove that 
you know, he didn't deserve to be in prison, that he could get out, that he could appeal his sentence. Is that kind of how you felt, too? Did, did, did you feel that you were unfairly sentenced? Yes. Why does Tony think he ended up behind bars? Nah, he, he don't know. You don't know. It's just, it just something that there's something bad. You know, just one of those days you just felt like, you know, you shouldn't have even got out of bed. So we find out in this book whether he gets his conviction overturned or whether he winds up on the dark side. Yes. Well, he, he was really, really, he was m- mostly motivated with, um, he ends up, before he gets locked up, he has this, a girlfriend. He has a girlfriend named Kat that he, met, that he meets in college. But they had broken up when he found out that he was going to be doing a, a, lengthy, a, a, link, a long length of time. He pretty much broke up with her, didn't want her sticking around, you know what I'm saying? Just just hanging around. I'm like, there's nothing he could do for her. Right. So he pretty much broke up with her. And um, so he ain't seen her in about a year or two, but she ends up having a baby. She ends up uh, getting back in touch with him because she uh, to let him know that, you know, that the daughter that she has is his. And that pretty much that that's that pretty much put the put the spark in him to say, I have to, get, you know, I have to get out of here. I got a daughter and I have to get out. Does she end up helping him? I mean, in the sense of just just being like the mental supporter, you know what I'm saying? Allowing, you know what I'm saying? Sending him some money or giving him phone calls. Yeah. So, I mean, she stays around to support him. She believes in him. Yeah. It's very realistic. It's very graphic. It's uh, it's exactly. What, what do you mean graphic? Give me an example of what you're talking about. <laughs> graphic. Okay. It's uh vulgar language being used. It's a uh, sexual content. It's an adult book of adult situations. You know, it's not, I'm not, I'm not pulling and punching. You know, this is the way it is in the book. That's, you know, that's the way it happens. Does this guy get into trouble in the jail? Do things happen there? Yeah, things happen in, in his surroundings. Like, I mean, that's the way the system is built. You know, you really can't avoid it because everything's just, you're so closed into everything that's going on. It's hard to, it's very difficult in, in those uh, circumstances to get away from everything and everybody because it's built that everybody is really on top of each other. Everybody's so close to, to each other. It's hard to avoid things like that. Um, but he, he, he's a very level-headed kid. You know, he went to college. You know, he, you know, he has a different type of mindset. You know, he's never been in trouble. He, he stays in school. You know, I mean, he's, he's on like a high road. Right. So for him to, for him to fall into you know, these type of vices, he was just, he's very level-headed. He hand, he handles the situation the way a young man is to handle the situation. Now, does this book continue, or does it just come to an end and that's it? Yes, it's a, it's a the way it ends, it makes you imagine, okay, well, well what happened, you know, what would happen in this situation? It's kind of like an open ending, you kind of. So you could write a sequel? Yes. Do you think you might do that? It's a strong possibility. Okay. You're going to keep us hanging. <laughs> Why did you call the book Never Walk Alone? The way the system's set up, the way the system's set up, they, uh, with, the, with the officers, like with the inmates or not, they're, they're pretty much mentally trained to pretty much do the time by yourself. Like, uh, we're, not, we're, not, we're, we're not to help each other. There's a lot of methods that are being used to uh, keep the inmates divided. And I understand, you know, you don't want inmates to all come together and just, you know, uh, revolt. And, you know, say I understand that. But then you got like you get a lot of people that just get caught up in the system. They really don't they really don't deserve to be there. And a lot's going on. So, you know, it, it's just a moniker that that just kind of stuck with me while I was in there as a. Uh, they, they try to teach you not to, but at the same time, the officer's code is the opposite. You know, their their code is, you know, never never walk alone. It's it's like this symbol, and it's all over all the prisons. It's like a stamp, a sticker. It's up, it's on the buildings, and it's, it's you know you see the state of Florida, and then on the outside of the on the outside of it, it says you know we never walk alone. It's something for the officers, not for the inmates. You know what I'm saying? But I'm talking to the inmates. There are other, you know what I'm saying, men that are in there and they're not they're not the stereotype. You know, they're not in there, you know, just horsing around and just being evil for no reason. You know, they're good guys. They do they're saying they're raising kids, their fathers, husbands, brothers, 
it just something happened and it just you know it, it, it was it was determined that it was taken you know outside of the law it was done outside of the law so they have to be punished and they you know they go to work every day they they take care of their kids but they made a decision that you know the law felt they took it into their own hands and they got to be punished for it do you feel a sense of accomplishment you know now that you've written and published this book yeah it was um it took it took it took a lot longer than i thought it would you know you have an idea about doing something and you just think like and then when you're really doing it you're like well this is more than i thought it would be yeah putting the story together it took long like i said it took a year it took a year for me to put you know the scenes together the story together so that in, that in itself i didn't think it was just i mean every day every day for you know however long it took that day if i might have just had an hour i might have spent three hours on it or you know, just every day put some time on it. You know, took took a year. Um, when I got when I got out, it took it took about two years. Cause I was fishing it, you know, to different publishing companies from every from New York to California. Like if, if I was going through other people's catalogs, the type of books that they put out, trying to see what my book would fall in at or what who it would be good for. So all the ones I felt, you know, would deliver this type of book, I, I sent my manuscripts to them. Shit, I didn't hear nothing back. So I tried again a couple months later. I tried again and started fishing out to different uh, publishing companies. And then I had got a I had got an email from Fulton Books in Pennsylvania, and they were like, "Yeah, was you know, we, you know, passed the review. We like it. We can." So I sat down and, and did the contract with Fulton Books. Good for you. You should be proud of yourself. It's it's, it's one in the yeah. It's one, <laughs> you know, it's one that because I I was you know, there was a lot of times when I wanted to just put down the pencil or whatever and just and just be like okay well it ain't worth it uh you know so i just continue to write i continue to write when i got out you know every door i knocked on didn't just open up you know it's very you know it could be it could be it could be damp when you don't feel just everybody just up and excited as you are about the book it's nice you know what i'm saying it's never really gonna be like that but once you get the opportunity once you find an opportunity you know you be ready for it and you know do everything you can with that opportunity yeah Good for you. Well, I wish you all the luck in the world. I really do. Thank you. Thank you for sharing your story. You have a great day. You too. You too. You too. I appreciate you. Thank you. During COVID, Kristen Reale found a very creative way to continue helping children with language issues. And now she takes another step in that direction with her first children's book entitled Skittle Diddle Skeleton. My first career, I, I was a speech language pathologist for over 30 years. And I worked with young children and it was a fabulous career. I love, I love um, working with young children who have speech and language difficulties and I love young children. And when uh, COVID hit and uh, my husband and I moved out to North Carolina, I stopped practicing, but I, to fill the void, I uh, started a story time hour in a park in an outside venue so that I could continue to read stories to young children and and the parents were involved in the story time and just continue to offer that experience where they could be with their peers and also be involved in storytelling with as I went by Miss Kristen. Uh, so I really enjoyed that. But Skittle Diddle really was inspired by a little boy that I worked with in the schools. He was a preschooler. He was five and he was having difficulty saying his S sounds. And a lot of times when I worked with children who had difficulty with specific sounds producing S's or K's or G's or some of those sounds that should be developed in the preschool age, I would write simple phrases or short stories that were meaningful to them to in, encourage them to practice their sounds and have fun with it. And it was around Halloween and this little boy loved Halloween. So I came up with Skittle Diddle Skeleton who had a hard time scaring all the kids <laughs> and he didn't have any skin on his heads or his toes. So a lot of S's, right. a lot of opportunities for this little boy to practice his S sounds in a fun Halloween story. And that's really what my whole purpose is when I choose stories for children, when I was practicing 
whether it was for developing speech or developing language, is that it wasn't them just listening to the story, but it was allowing them to share the story with me. Right. So a lot of repetitive phrases so that it was predictable for the young children to then chime in and tell the story with me so that they could practice their speech sounds or um, work on their language, whether they're working on saying, putting three words together or four words together, whatever that, you know, that goal was for that child, it was done in a fun way. So that's how Skittle Diddle was inspired. And this little boy loved Skittle Diddle and it really, you know, it was fun and it helped him work on the goals that were written for him to develop and improve his his articulation and it, you know it's kind of fun to say a skittle little skeleton and uh you will notice that um you know in the middle of the story there is definitely a lot of repetitive phrases you don't scare me no you don't scare me and each of the people that Skittle Diddle approaches on Halloween night says that same thing to him. So that's a great opportunity for a child to say, you don't scare me, you know, you don't scare me. <laughs> um, and then another repetitive phrase in the story was, you know, let it be told I'm Skittle Diddle and I've got good bones. <laughs> um, so that's what I was hoping to achieve with this. But also from a language standpoint, you know, you're, you're talking about d- different body parts, you right. know, because it talks about how, you know, his didn't have skin on his head or his toes or knees or his nose and kind of the rhyme and rhythm of the story. Um, I love melodic stories because that, Melody is also very um, helpful in developing language. I don't know when you're a kid and you would learn your phone number or some important information and you put it to a little jingle. It was so much easier to remember yep, for sure. and, fun to, and fun to say. And so um, I always loved finding authors that offer that to kids so they want to read it over and over again and and feel like they're reading it also to their parent or their friend or neighbor or whatever Um, and they can um, feel grown up and it also is an opportunity for them to develop their speech and language skills. So tell me the story. So Skittle Diddle is a skeleton and I, you know, skeletons can be scary, right? Right. So when I was writing the story, I was like, oh my gosh, I've got to make him really cute and, and more of a a kid-like skeleton. So you'll notice that he has the rosy cheeks and the blue eyes. And when I was working with the artist, um, you know, I wanted him to have a little chunkier bones versus thin bones. So during the artwork was the most tedious part of this right. is because I just really wanted to develop kind of the Casper the ghost feel, but with a skeleton. Yeah. And so he, it, it's Halloween day and obviously his favorite day of the year because he just loves to go out and scare the kids and spook whoever and have fun with it. But yet, even though he's a skeleton, he wants to find um, something special he can wear, too, and dress up. So on this Halloween night, he has a collection of hats, and he chooses his red fedora. So he's very excited to wear his red fedora. And Halloween night arrives, and he sees all the kids out in the street all dressed up for Halloween. And he tiptoes behind whether it's a boy or a girl or a mom or a dog, and he tries to scare them. And of course, all of them turn around and say, you don't scare me. No, you don't scare me. (laughs) And then, you know, obviously they'll mention where he doesn't have skin and he'll reach up and feel and say, yeah, you're right. Oh, wow. (laughs) You know, let it be told. I still got good bones. (laughs) And, you know, he proceeds to go to the next person and the next person until he realizes that, you know, he's not really scaring out anyone, anyone, but that's okay. And he ends up back at home and wishes everyone a Halloween night. Well, this sounds like it's a fun read for anyone. Well, I'm hoping, you know, I'm hoping it'll be um, 
Halloween classic someday. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to put it out on the market this year because it wasn't ready yet for Halloween. Yeah. But next year, I'm very excited come August when all the Halloween items seem to be adorning all the stores. Right. We can get Skittle Diddle in and uh, have it be a, a new Halloween story. And you'll have time to tell more people about it. Well, yeah. I mean, I think this is a great opportunity to kind of pinpoint what is, um, obviously, the market is young children. Right. So, um, you know, I see age children two through six would really enjoy this story. And even early readers, I think this would be a good story for early readers because it does have a lot of predictability and repetitive sentences and phrases that they can read and um, see. So Maybe you could uh, recreate your outdoor reading program. It is, it's a beautiful area. We have a great bookstore here in Walla Walla, so I'm really excited to... Um, speak. I haven't had a chance to speak to the owner yet, but you know, I people typically with with holidays. Um, once the holiday is over, it's not something they're looking to uh, go back to a Halloween story. Now, I will say, I'm glad the title is Skittle Diddle Skeleton. Um, and another group of individuals that will appreciate this book are my fellow speech language pathologists, my colleagues. So I'm excited to share this with um, the speech pathologists um, who are working with young children because it certainly will be a fun Halloween story, but it also address some great uh, articulation and language goals that they're focusing on with these kids. So it, it, it'll it'll be hopefully a a, a favorable story. <laughs> so what's next? Um, you know, I have another story that I've started with. Um, I love the holidays, um, so I, I probably will stick with that theme. I have a Thanksgiving story that I'm dabbling at right now. So I hope uh, it's just finding the time right to finish it. But uh, I have some good ideas about it. So I, I'm hoping that I can cr create another fun story that will also have that same rhyme and rhythm melodic feel to it and be a fu fun engaging story for young children all right thanks so much Kristen. max mayweather's been writing articles on issues affecting troubled kids for an online newsletter for more than a decade then he got an idea for a children's book entitled tommy and peep so where did this come from i kept having these characters in my head and i kept having uh a message in my head that I thought would be important, a message of being, you know, selfless and, and trying to encourage people to, you know, be of service to others. So so when I had the characters and the message, I said, you know, uh, I want to I want to write the story. Tell me about these characters. So Pete was actually based on a on a real character, a, a Chihuahua that I've had for a long time. And um, I just had a, a desire to to put Pete in, in a different kind of situations that I could combine with some kind of message, you know, so I created the other character, which is Tommy. Tommy is, is Peep's owner, you know, Tommy's young boy, and uh, he's Peep's owner, and um, they go on adventures together. Adventures through the woods, you know, exploring, meeting new, you know, people and stuff like that. So they start out through the woods, they encounter different, you know, animals, they find a lost puppy, they can't find his way back, and they decide that they want to help the lost puppy find his way back. And on their way to doing that, they encounter different uh, you know, animals in the woods that turn out to need their help. And so they help them with different things that they need. The first one that they meet is they meet a, a bird that's uh, caught in a tree. It's uh, caught in a vine. And I put that in there because that's something that actually happened to me before. <laughs> You know, so 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 they find a bird that's uh, caught up in a in a vine and 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 he's stuck. So they help him get loose. Um, so that's one thing that they do while they're you know trying to help the puppy find his way home. They find a uh, a group of uh, of ducks that need help. Now, did you get stuck in a vine, or did one of your animals get stuck in a vine? Uh, I found a bird that was stuck in oh, a vine. You did. <laughs> Yeah, just like, yeah, it's in the book, too, yeah. And you got him out? Uh, I, I, I wasn't able, it was a big bird, and uh, I tried to, I wasn't able to, I had to tell, it was a, it was, 
it was kind of weird. It was in front of a Whole Foods, and uh, so I went in and told them, and they, they I don't know who they, how they got them out, but they did. They got they got the bird out, so somehow. Okay, and Tommy and Peep get this bird out too. They do. Yes. The moral of the story is being of service to others and helping others in need. Beautiful. Now you got you got more books planned. I do. I would like to make a series of of books. With Tommy and Peep as the main characters and new characters that come along. And each story, I want to have, you know, like a message to it. Do you have kids by any chance? Uh, no, I don't. You know, I got a lot of kids in my family, so so I've shared it with, with them. And uh, that's that's another reason what, uh, that's another thing that made me want to write a children's book. Because I've got a lot of kids in my family that I, that I, uh, that I you know, interact with. So How many? Uh, it's too many to count. <laughs> Are you kidding know. me? Yeah, a lot of cousins and, you know, fr- <laughs> uh, friends and uh, nieces and nephews and everything like that. So, yeah, because, you know, I, I mean, do you have any thoughts on how to like, do you want to go into schools and read the book or do you want to do a book signing with all your cousins or? Yeah, I've, I've thought about that. Yeah, I'm counting on some of my relatives and everything to get it out there and spread the word and. Yeah, book signings and going to actual places like uh, some of the bookstores and libraries and stuff like that. Absolutely. All right, Max. Well, I hope I talk to you again. Oh, yeah. Same here. I hope I talk to you as well. You have a great day. Okay, you too. Thank you. Mariah Sam is a stay-at-home mom with a two-year-old and a one-year-old. And while they keep her very busy, they've also inspired her to write The Little Curry Leaf Tree. I enjoyed writing in high school, but I didn't really think of it as seriously to publish a book or anything like that until I was pregnant with my daughter and I was looking at the different books that I saw around and I didn't really see anything that kind of fit what I wanted to teach her, which at the time I wanted to have things that were biblically science-based. So I wrote a couple of books for her. Biblically science-based? Yes. Okay, so what does that mean? Um, It's science from a biblical perspective. I'm a Christian, and I wanted my daughter to see God's world through a biblical worldview. I wanted her to see different aspects of science, like I did a book on the solar system, the cell, and uh, dinosaurs, just to kind of help her understand the world and how God created it. So the books that I did for my daughter were all self-published. This is my first book that I published through page publishing. So why did you decide to go a more traditional route this time? Um, Self-publishing is a little bit harder to get your books out there. It's hard to get an audience. And I wanted to partner with the publisher so that I could have their professional help editing and illustration advice so that I could get a little bit um, more professional looking with my books. So how did that work out? Um, It worked out really well. I wrote this book after I just had my son, and I was really going to the two lessons that I focused in the book, which is you are enough for your family, and family is a great source of joy. And I was really reflecting on those lessons, and I wanted to write a book that would teach my kids those lessons and would also pull from their Indian heritage, which is from their father's side. Interesting. So the story follows the little curry leaf tree and her friends. And they noticed that their caretakers up at Chan and Amachi are sad. So they wanted to restore their joy by bringing back what they needed most, which was family. And how do they go about that? They try and remind them of things that they enjoyed, like the mango tree drops mangoes, thinking that they might enjoy a snack. The neem tree tries to give them shade, thinking they might be too hot in the sun. So they try different things to try and help them out. And in the end... The little curry leaf trees, leaves, is what brings back their family, which is what they need it most. So it's a garden, and all of these different plants or trees try to help them? Yes, uh, they try and help them by uh, offering what they have, like the hibiscus offers flowers, the mango tree offers fruit, and none of that seems to help them. At the end of the book, um, the garden is dismayed because... Nothing that they did seemed to help until the little curry leaf tree cries and drops her leaves. And from the leaves, up a Chananamachi are able to make a delicious meal that brings back their family. Up a Chananamachi? Amachi. That's a name? It's equivalent to grandma and grandpa. It's a term of respect in um, the culture. What a beautiful name. What a beautiful yes. word. Yes, it's um, 
my children call their, their grandparents on my husband's side that. Your little kids say that word. Yes, my daughter has it down, but my son doesn't quite have it yet. <laughs> I, I bet that's adorable to hear him say that. Yes, <laughs> it, it is really cute. It usually comes out as pacha at first. That's but, a um, big word. Yeah, I'm very impressed that they're able to get it. Is the um, little curry leaf tree something popular in India or something that kids learn about in India? The leaves from the curry leaf tree is often used to season the dishes and such. So it's a very common ingredient in a lot of their uh, food. Okay. You have little kids. Do, do your children play with other children? And are, do you have access to other children so you can read them the book? Yes. Um, I have a lot of nieces and a nephew. So um, it's enjoyable for me to see them enjoy the book as well and to to have them interact with it and to understand a little bit about India and also for them to learn that lesson through the book. But I'm going to try and get into different libraries and such to sign some books. Are there libraries near you? Yes, we have a lot of libraries near us. We have a great system. Oh, that's good. Where do we go from here? I'm hoping to start back up on writing and to keep publishing books for my kids and for other kids to enjoy. Are you doing a similar kind of something more like the curry leaf tree or maybe get some of those biblical science books published? Um, it really depends on my inspiration of what I, I try and do research and see things that pop out at me. I'd like to continue to write books about India just because my children are half Indian for my husband. Okay. And I want them to be able to connect with their heritage and to appreciate where they came from. That's a beautiful thing. Where do you come from? My family's been in Pennsylvania for forever. For like generations, right? <laughs> Yes. So I'm a very much so American. That's a really great thing to do for your kids. Thank you. How do you feel about how this all turned out? Like when you got the book in the mail? I am I was um, very proud and excited to see the book finished. And it just felt very surreal just holding it in my hand because up until that point, I had just seen it on my computer screen. So just having it physically in my hand, it just made it feel so real and just a very proud moment for me. Good for you. Thank you. I hope everybody's proud of you because it's not an easy task. Uh, so my family is very excited and supportive of the book. Great. All right. Well, thank you so much, Mariah. Yeah, of course. We hope you enjoyed this edition of the Reader House Author Roundtable, where authors from all walks of life come together to discuss the trials, tribulations, and triumphs of publishing their books. I'm Alice Stockton Rossini. We hope to see you back here every Saturday night at 8 o'clock or listen to our podcast anytime on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, TuneIn, and PodServe, just to name a few. The Author Roundtable is sponsored by Reader House Online Bookstore, where independent new authors come first.